Just for some housekeeping, my views today are my personal views. They're not the views of AT&T or any of my prior employers. So to start with, I think a lot of you in the audience are familiar with second requests and maybe not so familiar with HSRs. But in June of last year, the Federal Trade Commission announced major changes to the HSR notification process, which will implicate very likely e-discovery. Hard Scott Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act of 1976 requires parties to certain transactions to file a notification prior to consummation of the transaction. That allows the agencies time to review the transaction to see if there will be anti-competitive effects and to issue a second request during a waiting period, which is usually 30 days. During the HSR review, review period, there's a couple of steps and tools that the agencies have. So it's a 30-day waiting period in most cases. If the agencies review the filing and find that there's no issues, the waiting period will expire. There used to be something called a grant of early termination that is still in the rules. However, it's been suspended since 2021. So right now, the waiting period lasts the full time for most transactions. If the agencies determine that they need to ask more questions, they have a tool. One of those tools is a volunteer voluntary access letter. Some of you might be familiar with that. During the waiting period, you get a voluntary access letter, you try to respond to the letter, and either the agencies have more questions, they can issue a second request, parties can pull and refile, restarting the clock, or if the transaction is cleared within the 30 days. If the agencies still have questions, that's when you all come in as vendors and e-discovery practitioners and a second request is issued. Today, the HSR filing requires some documents. Sometimes e-discovery vendors are brought in. It requires a short narrative of the transaction, revenues by NAICS code, a list of entities, and some overlap information. In June of last year, though, these proposed rulemaking came out for the HSR. It's the first major overhaul since that 1976 act came out for the HSR, and it's significant increases the amount of information, the amount of documents that are required for the HSR filing. And so what I would predict is that e-discovery is going to become part of the HSR process going forward if those rules are finalized. And what we learned last week, which is some breaking news, is that the agency said we should expect the final rules to come out in the coming weeks, not months. They haven't issued a date. But what we would expect is the final rules to be published with a time that they will become effective. It's unclear whether it would be 30, 60, 90 days. That question was asked last week at the spring meeting, and the answer was they didn't know. So that will be new news. Thanks, Melanie. In addition to the agency's proposed changes to the HSR pre-merger notification process, another hot topic at the antitrust agencies is the use of ephemeral messaging and collaboration platforms. These have long been, as the agencies, in their view, have long been responsive to antitrust investigations, including a second request. But the agency's second request and other compulsory process may not have explicitly referred to some of these modern tools like Teams, Signal, Google Chat, that are really becoming a staple of the modern workplace. And so in January of this year, the FTC and DOJ made a joint announcement stating that they were updating the language in their preservation letters, their second request requests, their voluntary access letters, as well as other compulsory process, such as grand jury subpoenas and criminal antitrust investigations, to account for the increased use of ephemeral messaging and collaborative tools. And the purpose of this statement by FTC and DOJ was to reinforce obligations to preserve material during the pendency of a government investigation, including tools that allow for messages to disappear via ephemeral messaging capabilities. And both FTC and DOJ explicitly acknowledged that they recognize some of these tools allow for the immediate and irrevocable destruction of communications, yet at the same time, they're reminding parties who may be subject to an in-depth antitrust investigation, whether in the merger process process or as part of a conduct investigation that they need to preserve and produce relevant materials as part of the investigation. They also reiterated that the failure to adhere to this guidance regarding preservation and production could result in severe penalties, including obstruction of justice charges. And the FTC also highlighted it can move for civil spoliation sanctions, as well as refer certain conduct to criminal prosecutors through its criminal liaison unit. One thing in reviewing some of these updated documents 
trends that I've seen in recent investigations with clients. We've seen a revision to the definition of documents, so it is now significantly tailored to not only reference ESI that we're all used to, email and documents on computers, but also messaging applications, collaborative work environments, social media, and employee-owned devices. And in fact, these agency documents have all added definitions for collaborative work environment that references things like SharePoint, iManage, intranets, wikis, work tracking software, and other content management systems. They have also incorporated a definition for employee-owned devices and made clear that they expect business communications on employee-owned devices to be preserved and produced. And then finally, they have added a definition for messaging application, which specifically refers to things like Teams or Slack. Thanks for that overview. Melanie, let's start with the updated HSR rules or the proposed updated HSR rules. From a work stream or workflow perspective, tell us about the deviation from the status quo. Sure. So in the status quo, I would say the filing is pretty straightforward. You do have to collect a certain subset of documents. The proposed rules, though, significantly expand the scope, both in terms of the custodians, the types of documents requested, and there's this category, which we'll touch later, which is all agreements between the parties. And as many of you know, when you're collecting documents, all agreements between the parties in a large company or even in a small company, different business units might keep their documents separately. So there might not be one place where you can just hit a button and all of the agreements come to you. These are things that we would often have to do in a second request time frame. But here, I think that many HSRs will be affected because the workflow is going to move up to the HSR point in time, both for the requirements of the HSR and also for substantive strategy in filing your HSR. One thing that I would say is I looked back at the statistics and in fiscal year 21 and 22, about 3,000, a little over 3,000 HSRs were filed. And over the past 10 years, about 1% to 4% of those filings receive a second request. So in majority of the filings, people are probably not touching e-discovery vendors. In my experience at the law firms, most of the documents collected in the HSR were self-collect. There are cases where you do pull emails or there are a lot of documents or a transaction has been going on a really long time. So you do use a vendor to collect those documents. Here with the expanded scope, I think eDiscovery is going to touch many, many more HSR filings because only a small amount get a second request. But now the workflow is moved up to the HSR time period instead of a second request time period.